Hello there, welcome to ITV News Meridian. Your headlines in the Thames Valley. Changes to childcare, more help with energy bills and plans to get the over 50s back to work. Reaction in Reading to the spring budget. Starting work in this age is like really difficult. Go back 50s, 60s now. The majority of people are looking towards their retirement. The continuing fight against river pollution, the growing army of citizen scientists helping to clean up our waterways. Also tonight, the fundraiser gearing up to make his 16th journey to Ukraine with supplies. We catch up with John Parker from Tadley, whose humanitarian work knows no bounds. And the former footballers, including Reading's Laurie Sanchez, helping doctors learn more about how the beautiful game has taken its toll. Good evening. Extra childcare support, more help with our energy bills and a freeze on fuel duty. Just some of the measures announced in the Chancellor's spring budget. Working parents will now receive 30 hours a week free childcare for one and two year olds to get more people into work. Meanwhile, the energy price cap is to be extended for another three months until June. Well, Labour has described the budget as nothing more than a sticking plaster for the economy. And while there was good news for those who like a pint in a pub, wine drinkers and vineyards in the region will be feeling the pinch. Mark McQuillan reports. At this community centre in Reading, there is plenty to digest. The current Chancellor's first budget included announcements on childcare, energy bills and pensions. Plus a drive to get over 50s back into work, featuring skills training as part of so-called returnerships. Some here still need convincing on that particular plan. For me, I am over 50 and I have certain health condition. So it's like starting work in this age is like really difficult. To go back. 50s, 60s now. The majority of people are looking towards their retirement. Life's too short. As for the budget details, a lot rides on childcare. Parents of children over nine months will be entitled to claim 30 hours a week, but it will be rolled out in stages over the next few years. Those on universal credit will get more towards the cost of their childcare and it will be paid up front. There'll also be investment in more wraparound care for school-aged children. A new voluntary scheme will help those with disabilities find work if they want to, up to £4,000 per person. Workers will now be able to put up to £60,000 a year into their private pension pots before paying tax. And the limit to what can be saved in their lifetime before tax is being abolished altogether. Back at home, households will continue to benefit from the energy price guarantee extended for the next three months, capping bills at £2,500 a year. Charges will also be brought down for those on pre-payment metres. £63 million is to be invested in leisure centres and there will also be £100 million for charities and community organisations. Finally, at the pumps, fuel duty has been frozen for a year and at the other pumps, those in pubs, the government's addressing the duty on draft products, freezing the cost of a pint. That news is bittersweet for this brewery near Farnham in Surrey. The freeze is mitigated by uncertainty over energy bills and the rising cost of their ingredients, some by more than 40%. It still looks like we're going to see a duty increase come the start of August and that uh, the effect of that duty might have a negative impact overall on the, on the brewing sector. I think there's lots of levers that could be pulled and aren't being at the moment. One of the benefits potentially of Brexit is we have the ability to reduce that VAT in the hospitality sector and that would make a massive difference. In the wine sector there is little cause for celebration tonight. At this vineyard on the South Downs they're concerned a big rise in duty will have an impact on customers and the growth of the English wine sector. For still wine, it means potentially an increase of 45p a bottle, which is the biggest increase in 50 years of duty. Um, at a time when um, people are really struggling, consumers out there, and there are 33 million wine drinkers out there, um, are really struggling because of the uh, cost of living crisis. Better news though for parents of young children. Those aged one and two will ultimately be entitled to 30 hours of free childcare per week. 
a move aimed at supporting families and helping those in work. We've got lots of bread, lots of potatoes. And for mums like Emily, there's a welcome move on universal credit. Obviously with universal credit and childcare, um, you're always kind of being taken from one hand and having to give with the other, or you're having to budget how you're going to pay for your childcare as well as getting to work. And so if you could be able to do your childcare, not have to do it, pay it up front and wait for it to come back, that would help so many families. Families who, judging by the popularity of this excess food centre in Reading, need as much help as they can get. Mark McQuillan, ITV News. Well, let's get reaction now from Westminster and cross live to our political correspondent, Phil Hornby. Phil, how have things uh, gone down there? Well, Matt, this felt to me a little bit like the budget of a brand new government setting out its stall for the next five years with some of its flagship announcements taking several years to roll out fully, like the childcare announcement. And you couldn't help wondering when you heard the South West Surrey MP Jeremy Hunt talk about the year 2025 or 2026, you couldn't help wondering, well, will the Conservatives still be in government then to uh, get the credit for the fruition of the announcements that were announced today? Looking at the opinion polls, that looks doubtful. Let's hear now from some Thames Valley MPs. It was excellent. Um, as a Tory MP sat behind the Chancellor, you can't fail to be impressed by what the announcement was today. I think so much support for people, um, but for me the most important bit of it was um, getting people back into work. To reward hard work, to give employees more of their salary, um, just a fantastic budget and uh, great for the economy. And there's a few areas that I think we're totally missing. For places like Oxfordshire, the fact that they've completely slashed the cycling and walking budget from 300 million to 100 million over the next uh, few years will be a big blow to our plans for a net zero Oxfordshire. And I sincerely hope uh, that nonetheless we'll be able to deliver some of those schemes. I'm afraid it was a sticking plaster budget, and as we heard earlier um, it doesn't really address many of the key problems facing the country particularly a long period of low growth that we've had under the current government they should be doing far more to encourage uh, emerging sectors of the economy do more to support people back into employment and it reflects a long period of failure by the current government going back to 2010 There was talk of investment zones, but they tend to be in the northwest or the northeast or Wales or Scotland or Northern Ireland nothing for us. I guess that's what levelling up means. One of the economic forecasts that we heard today that I think everyone here thinks is good news is the forecast about inflation, the increase in the cost of living, which should by the end of this year be down to between 2 and 3%. Inflation has caused so much damage to everybody in the Thames Valley. That's got to be good news. Yes, indeed. Uh, as ever, Phil, for now, thank you. Now the news, a jury has retired to consider its verdict in the trial of a retired GP from Bracknell, accused of sexually assaulting patients in the 1990s. 63-year-old Stephen Cox denies committing eight indecent assaults against seven female patients between October 1990 and September 1997. The allegations against him include touching patients and exposing himself. Teachers and university lecturers from across the Thames Valley have joined a rally in London. The National Education Union organised a march from Hyde Park to Trafalgar Square. The union said opinion polls show that the majority of parents are supporting the strikes. The government described the walkout as extremely disappointing. Regional BBC staff have also been taking part in a 24-hour strike in protest at proposed cuts to local radio services, including BBC Radio Berkshire and BBC Radio Oxford. Support local news! Support local news! Support local news! Journalists joined picket lines like this one outside South today in Southampton. The National Union of Journalists said its members were determined not to stand by and see local radio output dismantled. The BBC said it is looking to modernise local services by boosting online content. Well, meanwhile, train services will be hit by more strike action tomorrow and on Saturday. Most operators will only run trains for limited hours. On Chiltern, there will be no trains running north of Banbury and uh, one train an hour into Marlebone to and from Aylesbury, Banbury and Oxford. There will be also a limited service on Great Western and Southern and trains will start later than normal on the Elizabeth Line. Tumble dryer has burst into flames at a property in Oxfordshire. Fire crews were called to Hayford Park near Bicester last night. The appliance caught light inside a shed before a neighbour managed to partially put it out. 
Hey, you're watching ITV News Meridian in the Thames Valley, still to come on tonight's programme. We're going to meet these so-called citizen scientists working uh, to clean up our rivers and streams by monitoring pollution themselves. And preparing for his 16th trip to war-torn Ukraine, John from Tadley's latest mission to help refugees and their much-loved pets. Well, for more from us, of course, you can go to our website, itv.com slash meridians, the address, the number, as ever, 0808 1010 095. And you can follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter and on Instagram. More news in a fire which destroyed a family furniture business in Andover is believed to have been caused by an electrical fault in the building. More than 100 firefighters tackled the flames at the Dormy House on the Woolworth Business Park in Andover on Monday. The fire also spread to a cosmetics firm next door. Seven men have been fined for trespassing and poaching in Oxfordshire. Four by fours were driven across fields at Britwell at Salome near Benson, shining lamps in January last year. Ball bearings, a hunting lamp and a lock knife were recovered, which police say is evidence of poaching. The men, all aged between 18 and 31 and from Berkshire and Surrey, have been ordered to pay fines and court costs. Queen met the King at Buckingham Palace as Brian May received a knighthood. The guitarist, who is 75 and lives at Windlesham in Surrey, has been given the honour for services to music and charity. He has spent decades campaigning for animal rights. Their work has begun on a new £35 million accommodation village at Legoland Windsor, which the park says will provide sustainable tourism. Maidenhead MP Theresa May joined other dignitaries for the event, where 150 lodges will be built on a 10-acre site. The Woodland Village is set to be the first carbon-neutral accommodation built by the owner, Merlin, anywhere in the world. And if you live in Reading and feed red kites, then a university research team wants to speak to you. The university is investigating the bird of prey's feeding trends in and around the town. Experts want to better understand the impact of leaving out food on the birds and the environment. Red kites were extinct in England before they were reintroduced in 1989. A previous study found one in 20 households in Reading left food out for them. Firefighters have rescued a horse which had fallen in a stable in Hampshire. An animal rescue team and fire crews were called to a sheep wash lane in Denmead where an Arab mare had fallen and was unable to get up. The animal was sedated before it was winched to safety and left with a local vet and its owner. The seed bank in Sussex is celebrating having a record number of plant species. Kew's Millennium Seed Bank at Wakehurst has collected more than 2.4 billion individual seeds, representing around 40,000 different wild plants. Researchers there say the achievement is invaluable for tackling the global biodiversity crisis. Now, hundreds of people across the region are joining the fight to try and clean up our rivers by collecting and providing samples to monitor pollution. Yes, these so-called citizen scientists pass their findings to laboratories and their work has been hailed as an important source of data to assess the scale of damage to our environment. Well, just 14% of our waterways currently meet good standards of cleanliness, according to figures from Parliament's Environmental Audit Committee. With more, here's Nick Smith. Rivers are the arteries of our ecosystems, but they're also a great source of recreation for thrill seekers like this canoeing club enjoying this flow of rapids. But this group is also playing a role in monitoring pollution in the water, twice a week collecting samples to test for levels of nitrates and phosphates. Zoe Rowe is one of these canoeists turned citizen scientists, telling me she wanted to play a role in protecting the waterways she's come to value so much. As a paddler, it was interesting for me to understand the data of what pollutants were potentially in the water. I've been on the rivers for nearly 40 years, um, and in the time I've been on, the clarity of the river, just the general cleanliness of the river, it's a lot more dirty, and we get sick. Um, I had an eye infection last year. A lot of us get physically sick from being in the water. That ha happens a lot more often, really. In fact, not a single river in our region has received a clean bill of health from chemical contamination, according to an inquiry conducted last year. With thousands of miles of water crisscrossing our part of the world, 
qualified scientists like Professor Steve Fletcher, director of the Global Plastics Policy Centre at the University of Portsmouth, says those volunteering to collect samples gives them a better picture of the scale of the problem. Yeah, citizen scientists can be really useful, particularly when we're trying to collect really large data sets that we can't collect as scientists on our own and we need help to get out to the corners uh, of the world where it's really difficult to do it ourselves. Some people say that the, the data is sometimes not of the highest quality, but my view is it depends on what you ask the citizen scientists to do and you need to ask them to do things that are within their skill set. So what happens to all of that data? Earthwatch is the organisation coordinating thousands of citizen scientists, pooling and verifying their findings to assemble a more comprehensive picture of our environment. They're incredibly invaluable volunteers, producing amazing data, filling in information gaps, and we make sure that they follow set guidelines and procedures. The more people that we have collecting measurements all puts that pressure on those who are accountable for the pollution that we're seeing. Those like Zoe and her canoe club have a knowledge and a passion for their local rivers, which many would struggle to match. And their insight and commitment to protecting them may prove vital in the fight to combat pollution. Nick Smith, ITV News. Right, uh, the ITV Evening News continues with the national and uh, international headlines at 6.30. With the details, here's Geraint Vincent. On the programme tonight, Jeremy Hunt's plan to boost the economy. The Chancellor unveiled his budget today, pledging to make the UK one of the most prosperous countries in the world. We'll have reaction and analysis, and we'll be answering your questions on what the changes mean for you. On a day when hundreds of thousands of workers went on strike in what could be the biggest walkout so far this year. Join me for those stories and more at 6.30. Now, over the past year, we've reported on people from across the South doing their bit to help the war effort in Ukraine, often driving supplies thousands of miles across Europe. But one man who's gone above and beyond is John Parker from Tadley in Hampshire, who's making his 16th trip to the war-torn country, carrying humanitarian aid and supplies to help soldiers. Well, as well as huge amounts of fundraising, John has spent thousands of pounds of his own money to provide aid. He's enlisted volunteers and even helped refugees and their pets escape. Charlotte Breer Edney went to meet him as he prepares for his next trip. This block of buildings here was one. One piece we've just been told. Just one of the devastating sites John Parker has come across on his trips bringing aid to Ukraine. Back home near Tadley he's packing up vehicles to head out there again. Going out there is a real eye-opener. Seeing destroyed buildings, uh, villages that have been completely decimated with bullet holes everywhere. And it's just really heartbreaking and it really seeing it firsthand, you know, in, in real life just brings it home even more. In his 15 trips to the country, he's transported tons of humanitarian and medical aid, as well as pet food and aid for animals. On top of doing huge amounts of fundraising, John has spent thousands of pounds of his own money. I think it's wonderful. You know, I, I just hope people keep supporting him, making the donations and stuff like that, because, I mean, it's, the, it's, it's those people that are making those donations that make this possible. Obviously, John is the one that's orchestrating all of this, um, but he couldn't do that without the support of, of the public. He's transported over 30 refugees to host families in the UK and rescued more than 15 animals in his big red bus. In fact, his staffy Rocco is a key member of the team who's also made the journey to Ukraine several times. And it's not just the supplies that will be donated, it's the pickup trucks too. John has close links with charities and contacts in the Ukrainian military, which both have a constant need for four-wheel drives capable of navigating damaged roads, mud and snow. This is what happened to a previous vehicle John donated when it went over a landmine. Amazingly, everyone survived. Uh, it's a uh, life of our soldiers. How we can uh, quickly move there from front line to the hospital, how we can quickly move these forces from one uh, point to, to another point, you know, it's a very important. John tells me there is a very personal reason why he started all this. 
So I'm part Polish, my granddad was Polish and he suffered greatly during the Second World War. Uh, he was a war orphan, uh, taken to Siberia to prison camp. So growing up as a, as a child, I heard this story over and over again from my grandmother. And that's what really hit home when history kind of it's repeated itself, but it's a very much a long-term plan of mine to carry on helping. John's red bus has taken on a life of its own, and he now plans to wind down his day job and run the charity full time. Charlotte Brewer-Redney, ITV News, near Tadley. Safe travels to John and Rocco. They're doing some amazing charity work. Right, in sport, there are two massive matches in the Premier League this evening. Brighton host rivals Crystal Palace with the Seagulls, boosted by Adam Lallana, signing a new one-year contract. While at the other end of the table, Southampton would move out of the relegation zone if they beat Brentford. Now in the Football League, two of our sides were in action last night. In League One, Portsmouth's hopes of a late surge to the playoffs were given a boost with a convincing win at Accrington. The home side had their goalkeeper sent off uh, after 10 minutes and Pompey made them pay. Joe Piggott scoring from the resulting uh, free kick. Uh, in the second half, Rico Hackett doubled their lead and although Piggott was then shown a red card, Colby Bishop made sure of all three points by scoring against his former side, his 20th goal of the season so far. Took his time, there it is. And there it goes. <laughs> <laughs> and in League Two, Swindon had to settle for a draw at Walsall, with Charlie Austin nearly grabbing a winner late on. The point means the Robins are up to 10th place. Now, former stars of the football world are taking part in a study being conducted in Southampton to find out more about the impact of injuries picked up during their playing careers. The project will look at what damage may have been done to footballers' feet and ankles. This will help sportsmen and women today treat and manage their injuries better. With more, Derek Johnson. Loris Sanchez walked onto the pitch hundreds of times during an illustrious playing career with, among others, Reading. Now he's being put through his paces in Southampton General Hospital. The man who scored the famous winning goal in Wimbledon's unlikely FA Cup victory over Liverpool back in 1998 is one of the many former footballers taking part in the biggest UK study of its kind. It's no free ride being an athlete, not just a footballer, but any, any athlete. Sometimes you have to pay, and the pay, time you pay is when you're out of the limelight, when you, people you know, can just about remember who you are, when bits of your body start to pack up on you because of the stuff you put you through as a professional athlete. The aim to look at wear and tear on feet and ankles. Research has shown that footballers are two to three times more likely to get knee osteoarthritis compared with age-matched men in the general population. So we have taken 100 x-rays um, of other people that can compare them. We can see if footballers have more risk of developing osteoarthritis and then we can start to look at how we put prevention in, particularly with the younger footballers of today. Will you tell me if I'm going wrong? Also taking part in the test is Linvoy Primus, who played almost 200 games for Portsmouth. He finally retired because of a knee injury. Like others, he often played through the pain. Right at the end, it, was, it, it, it broken too much in terms of the damage was getting bigger and wider. I would go again, but there's so much I know about my knees now that I didn't know before, and, uh, and that helps me live my life you know, now without any uh, real problems. Managing injuries isn't just important for those making a living out of sport. Anything that this study finds out can be hopefully filtered down into recreational footballers such as myself who play on Saturdays and Sundays and don't know about anatomy and don't know about the uh, implications of physical activity and it would help the public in general just to just to learn a little bit about them about their bodies. Um, hopefully I've got a few more years left in me but it's about being fit during that time it's not just surviving it's about being able to have mobility to have you know the use of your brain and so any studies that help um, me point out where I perhaps need to look at or that can help current players about thinking about their futures you know it's important for the profession as a whole. Researchers are also looking into head injuries and cognitive impairment, trying to understand the ugly side of the beautiful game. Derek Johnson, ITV News. 
It's really interesting because, you know, we've seen studies before about the impacts of, of heading the football, but I've never heard of one about the impacts on, on the joints in terms of yeah. arthritis and that kind of thing. And that is the thing because obviously we all rely on our yeah. legs and yeah. feet. Together. I think that is just absolutely fascinating. And you expect young footballers are obviously super fit men and women at the peak of their physical mm. fitness, but the impacts later on can be huge. So really interesting to hear about. Right, let's get a check on the weather forecast. Is it going to stay cold? Let's find out with the details for us tonight. Here's James Wright. Feels like home, whatever the weather. Valent boilers and heat pumps. Sponsors ITV Meridian Weather. Hello, good evening. Rather unsettled over the next few days. Plenty of outbreaks of rain. We've got low pressure systems nearby. This is a big one that's not really going to move particularly fast. Splits into two, which doesn't really help things. So that's going to give us all these little bands of rain. And if it's not rain, it'll be showers. Hopefully there will be some bright spells in between all of this. It means that uh, overnight tonight, after a bit of a damp evening, we will end up with a drier end. It will be a bit of a murky end to the night too. Some of this cloud is quite low. As far as temperatures go, well, they'll have actually dipped to the lowest point fairly early on in the night with lows of around three to six Celsius. By the time we're waking up, temperatures will be up into the high single figures. A little bit of a breeze out there. That's going to help tomorrow in a sense that it'll help to chop up some of the cloud. So expect bright spells from time to time. That said, there will be enough cloud to see a few outbreaks of light patchy rain. They could turn up pretty much anywhere. But the story of the day is that it's going to be much milder than today. That southerly breeze, which will be quite noticeable around the coast, drawing in that mild air from the continent. So we're looking at highs of around 12 or 13 Celsius. What happens next? Well, we remain in this rather unsettled theme. This front here turns into a bit of a wave, so it might throw a bit more rain into our neck of the woods. Uh, likewise, there will be quite a few showers pushing in uh, on that breeze. Temperatures continuing to get a little bit milder, looking highs of around 14 Celsius. So in the bright spells, that should feel quite nice. Similar a picture on Saturday, a little bit showery, a little bit of a chillier start, but still highs of 14 Celsius, so nice and mild. Valent sponsors ITV Meridian Weather. I mean, there is a slight move in the right direction weather-wise, isn't there? Slight just, move, Matt, yeah. but it's just Easter. That's all I That's, want. I just want a Easter. nice, warm Easter, please. Yes. Um, in just a moment here, it's the ITV Evening News with Geraint Vincent. I'll have your late update. That's just after 10.30. But for now, uh, that is it from us. Thank you very much for watching. We'll see you soon. Have a great evening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.